again, everybody. My name is Dr. Jacob Graham, and in this video, we're going to begin to go over the most important dissonant chord type in common practice music, the dominant seventh chord. Today, we will cover some of the theoretical explanations of the dominant seventh, and in the next two videos, we'll go over how they are dealt with in thorough bass and in counterpoint exercises. Theory has always lagged behind practice and composers began using dominant seventh chords in their music long before anyone came up with a rationalization for the way that they were being used. The theory of this chord is therefore sort of complicated, and I'm going to start by going on a little bit of a tangent, so please indulge me. We can begin by considering this four-voice first species counterpoint exercise that I used back in the video on Roman numerals. These kinds of exercises were called strict composition in the 18th century, and they were strict in at least two different senses of the word. First, the strict style referred to conservative church music written in the style of Palestrina. Music that only uses consonant 5-3 and 6-3 position triads was considered appropriate even for the most traditional sacred settings. If you cannot wear a hat in church, then you certainly cannot sing unprepared dissonances. Second, these exercises were strict in the sense that they restricted the composer's choices. The cantus firmus provides structure for what the composition can be. The composer does not get to choose the length of the composition or the key, since those are predetermined by the length and key of the cantus firmus. Even the chord-to-chord -chord voice leading, connecting one measure to the next, is delimited by the pre-existing structure provided by the cantus firmus. If the cantus firmus leaps up a fourth, for instance, then there are only so many ways of harmonizing that leap. Strict composition was contrasted with free composition, which meant the opposite of strict in both senses. Free composition was the sort written by composers outside of the church, court composers in their symphonies and string quartets, and theater composers in their operas. Free could also be used to refer to music that was written without the restrictions of a cantus firmus. What sort of structures replace the cantus firmus in free composition? In other words, what voice leading structures do phrases of music written for the church, court, and theater have in common, if anything? It turns out that there is a generalized pattern that inheres both in strict and in free composition. If we were to take our counterpoint exercise and ask ourselves which of these chords would be likely to occur with any C major cantus firmus, not just this particular one, we would conclude that any exercise written on a C major cantus firmus would probably begin with a one chord, since our melodies need to begin on stable scale degrees. And it would end with a root position five chord followed by another root position one chord. The reason for this was explained in the video on three voice counterpoint, and will be explained again a little later on in this video. The chords in the middle of the exercise are impossible to predict beforehand without knowing the particular shape of the cantus firmus. These three components form the boundaries of most complete phrases of tonal common practice music. If I told you that I had composed a sonata movement in the key of C major, or an aria, or a motet, or whatever, but I did not tell you anything else about the piece, an enculturated musician would still assume these three boundary components. 
This eventually led to what is known as harmonic function theory. The tonic function provides stability for the beginning and the end, and the dominant function confirms the tonic and brings about harmonic and melodic closure at the authentic cadence. The topic of this video is the dominant seventh chord, which is a special kind of dissonance that arose out of the authentic cadence, which would be used to indicate the closure of a phrase, or of a section of music, or of an entire composition. To understand this kind of dissonance, we need to look more closely at the voice leading of the authentic cadence. I'm going to be writing things out in open score, so that each voice in the four-voice texture is written on its own staff. We know from counterpoint that the strongest kind of melodic closure is the tenor cadence, which descends to scale degree one from above. This is the melodic cadence that Fuchs uses in all of his Cantus Firmi. The tenor cadence is named after the tenor voice part, but just like all of the other melodic formulas that we're going to look at, this cadence can occur in any of the voice parts. It doesn't literally need to be performed by the tenor. The best counterpoint against this close is the soprano cadence, which approaches scale degree one by step in contrary motion. Together, the tenor and soprano cadence were known as the clausula vera. We cannot add a third voice that approaches scale degree one by step without forming parallel octaves, and so the only consonant bass line possible to support the clausula vera is the bass cadence, which leaps from scale degree five to scale degree one, either ascending or descending. The only other three voice cadence would feature a new part written between the tenor and soprano cadences. In this case, there's only one possibility. The alto part must take scale degree four above the tenor's scale degree two, and resolve either down by step to scale degree three, as shown here, or up by step to scale degree five over the final chord. By simply lumping all four cadence formulas together, we get a four-voice authentic cadence that includes our dominant seventh chord, resolving to the final tonic chord. Notice that this dominant seventh chord features a dissonant harmonic interval of a minor seventh between the bass scale degree five and the alto scale degree four. This dissonant chord could not be used in a first species counterpoint exercise for this reason, it is dissonant. But it was used very commonly at the authentic cadences that closed phrases, sections, and entire pieces of free composition. More than any other 18th century theorist, Jean-Philippe Rameau changed the way that we define cadences. In the Renaissance and early Baroque, cadences were defined according to combinations of melodic formulas. The Landini cadence, the Burgundian cadence, the double leading tone cadence, these were essentially different formulas for melodic closure. Rameau instead thought primarily harmonically, and his definition of the authentic cadence was premised entirely on the descending root motion by fifth of these two chords, rather than the melodic motion of any particular voice. Rameau's harmonic definition allowed him to use the concept of an authentic cadence to explain root motion by fifth in inverted chords, and even in areas of the phrase outside of the cadence per se. Rameau also promoted the idea of thinking about the seventh chord as an independent harmonic unit. If he had made a periodic table of elements for his harmony, it would include only two elements, 
the triad, and the seventh chord. Most other theorists of the time were more reluctant to claim that the seventh chord was an independent harmonic unit. For Johann Philipp Kernberger, for instance, there was only one element on his periodic table, and it was the consonant triad. All dissonances, even the dominant seventh, needed to have a linear voice-leading justification. Kierenberger provided this illustration of some of those kinds of justifications. The first example shows a dominant seventh chord where the dissonant seventh is prepared in the top voice as a suspension. Skipping the second example for a moment, the third example shows the chordal seventh approached and left by step as a dissonant passing tone, just like in second species counterpoint. The middle example is the interesting one. Here, Kernberger shows a dissonant chordal seventh approached by leap over a stationary bass tone. In thorough bass, these kinds of dissonances are often called freely struck, meaning that they are not prepared in the same way as other dissonances. Even Kernberger is willing to make an exception for dissonance of the dominant seventh chord. It does not need to be as strictly prepared as other dissonant chord types. Kernberger explains this exception by distinguishing between what he calls incidental dissonance and the essential dissonance of a dominant seventh chord. Incidental dissonance, which is often also translated as accidental dissonance, is the kind that comes about entirely through the standard rules of voice leading. Notice, for instance, that this chord is technically a 5-7 but it is not the same kind of dominant seventh that would occur at a cadence and that we have been discussing so far in the video. This one is generated coincidentally by the chain of descending 7-6 suspensions. essential dissonance of the dominant seventh chord is something exceptional to the standard rules of voice leading. We make this exception in part because of how compositionally useful the dominant seventh chord is in defining an authentic cadence. Notice that only the chord built on scale degree 5 in any diatonic scale has the harmonic quality of a major triad and the interval of a minor seventh between the root and the chordal seventh. That means that hearing the dominant seventh chord is all the information that a listener would need in order to determine what key they are in. This key defining property is characteristic of the dominant seventh. The chordal seventh in this example is approached and left by step in the same direction, but calling it a simple passing tone would not be the whole story. Passing tones are not supposed to move in a one-to-one -one rhythmic proportion with the other voices of the texture. Ultimately, we make an exception for the preparation of the chordal seventh of a dominant seventh chord because this kind of chord is just essentially dissonant. To conclude, let me outline the plan for the next several videos in this series. I like to picture the world of tonal voice leading as a series of concentric circles. At the center are the consonant triads. The 5-3 and 6-3 chords are self-sufficient. If a piece were composed that only used consonant triads, we could explain its voice leading entirely using what we learned in our first species counterpoint exercises and the thorough bass exercises that I introduced in the previous video. 
This bubble is the realm of strict composition, and it is entirely diatonic, other than the limited application of accidentals to accommodate the leading tone at a cadence, for instance. Everything outside of this bubble is free composition, and here is where we encounter freer use of chromaticism to change key through modulations and for expressive purposes. The next bubble is the one containing the essential dominant seventh chords. These chords are only relatively self-sufficient. We can explain how they are used by showing how they resolve to the consonant triads in a way that conforms to the harmonic cadence as we've discussed in this video. The last and largest category are voice-leading chords. These chords are not self-sufficient at all. In fact, it doesn't even make sense to think of composing an entire piece using only voice-leading chords. They gain their meaning based on the context provided by consonant triads and dominant sevenths. These chords often form incidental dissonances, and their voice-leading is explained through the study of combined species counterpoint and thoroughbase. I've already put out one video on the concept of a passing chord, which is one type of voice leading chord. In the future, I will make videos on suspension chords, neighboring chords, and even more exotic kinds of dissonant voice leading chords. That's all for this video. Stay tuned for the next one when we will learn the voice leading involved with dominant seventh chords from the perspective of thorough bass.